Shalom everyone and welcome to this week's episode of Messiah in the Torah. This week we have come to the Torah portion that deals with the uh, exaltation of Joseph in Egypt and the dreams of Pharaoh. And uh, the title in or the name of this Torah portion in Hebrew is Miket, which literally means at the end. So we're going to read now from Genesis chapter 41 and verse 1. After two whole years, Pharaoh dreamed that he was standing by the Nile. Now, um, this is that it literally means at the end of two years, it indicates that this uh, Torah portion has to do with the end times. And it's talking about the end of two years. It is uh, the very final uh, time period that will precede the third day of resurrection for the whole world when the Messiah returns and to set up his kingdom on this earth. So this is what uh, the story is all about here. It is prophesying about the end of this age. Let us go to uh, Hosea chapter 6 and look at this in uh, the first two verses there where we see the same theme. We need to remember that the Torah is the foundation for all the revelation about our salvation in the entire Bible. Uh, what is coming after the Torah is only building upon what is already there in picture form, in seed form of truth that is found in the Torah. So here we're gonna see once again this theme about two and uh, three, from verse one, come let us return to the Lord for he has torn us he, that he may heal us. He has struck us down and he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live before him. So this is the uh, theme throughout scripture. The third day is talking about resurrection. Of course, we know that Yeshua the Messiah, he rose from the dead on the third day, but it's also uh, talking about the third millennium when the resurrection of those who, who believe in him will take place, unless we are fortunate to be alive when he appears and we will be transformed it's, uh, in the twinkling of an eye. So at the end of two years, that's what is the theme of this week's Torah portion. And it deals with the dreams that Pharaoh had. And it said he dreamed that he was standing by the Nile. Literally in the Hebrew it says that he was standing by the flood. Uh, it is understood, of course, that it is referring to the Nile, the river Nile. He was standing by the river. Now, in those days, the Nile River was worshipped as a god because the entire economy of Egypt uh, as the superpower of the world was depending upon the Nile. So when he is uh, dreaming here, Pharaoh, that he is standing by the flood, by the Nile, it indicates that it's talking about what is referring to the uh, world economy, the finances, and it is dealing with a crisis that is going to take place at the end of this age. And that is, of course, also a theme that we see throughout Scripture. Uh, it is talk, uh, referred to in many different ways, but we know that before the Messianic era breaks upon the earth, there is going to be an unprecedented time of turmoil, of difficulty uh, in, the, in the world. And that's what Pharaoh's dreams are all about. So he dreamed first that he uh, saw seven fat cows um, that were uh, grazing by the Nile River. 
And then after them came seven very skinny cows and they swallowed up the fat cows, but they were still as skinny as they were uh, before. And then he had the second dream about seven very um, prosperous uh, uh, grains. Uh, let's see here what it says in the English here. Behold, there were seven ears of grain, plump and good, and they were growing on one stalk. This is verse five. And behold, after them uh, sprouted seven ears, thin and blighted by the east wind. And the thin ears swallowed up the seven plum uh, and full ears. And Pharaoh awoke and behold, it was a dream. And then we read here in verse, seven, uh, verse eight, sorry. In the morning, his spirit was troubled and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men. Pharaoh told them his dream, but they were, there was none who could interpret them to Pharaoh. This is talking about uh, that the crisis that is going to take place in the end times, it is going to baffle all the wise men of this world. It is going to come as a complete surprise. They have no um, foreboding about it. It is going to, uh, they have no uh, wisdom how to deal with it because it will be unprecedented. But God has everything in his control control under his control and we know that the word of the prophets in the scriptures they can tell us exactly what is going to happen in the end times and it's so important that we study the scriptures so that we will not be unprepared for what is coming now when nobody could interpret the dreams then um, one of the servants he was the uh, cupbearer Verse 9, he said to Pharaoh, I remember my offenses today. Now, at the end of last week's Torah portion, we had the story about the cupbearer and the baker and their dreams. And uh, because they had offended Pharaoh and were put in prison, ended up with Joseph in the same prison that where he was. And one night they had these dreams. Now, those dreams where the cupbearer was exalted and the, uh, the baker, he was uh, killed. It is uh, a, a picture of what happened at the cross. When our old nature, the flesh, which is uh, uh, pictured by the bread, how it was crucified uh, on the cross and it was uh, buried with us. And, but at the same time, the cupbearer is representing the wine, which is the new nature, the resurrection from the dead that took place. And, and so it is after two years, at the end of two years from the cross, we can say that this crisis is going to take place just before the kingdom of God is going to break forth in the earth. And so we know this is very, very um, um, something that, that concerns us very much because now it is at the end of 2000 years from the death and resurrection of Messiah. So this cupbearer, he is, um, of course, he was exalted again into his position, but he had um, before that offended Pharaoh. So he says, I remember uh, my offenses today, verse nine. When Pharaoh was angry with his servants and put me and the chief baker in custody and the house <clears throat> in the house of the captain of the guard, we dreamed on the same night, he and I each having a dream with its own interpretation. And so he says there was a, a man there, a young man, verse 12, a young Hebrew was there with us, a servant of the captain of the guard. When we told him, he interpreted our dreams to us, giving an interpretation to each man according to his dream. And as he interpreted to us, so it came about. I was restored to my office and the baker was hanged. Verse 14, then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph and they quickly brought him out of the pit. And when he had shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came in before Pharaoh. Now, before we deal with verse 14 here, that is uh, very, it's full of revelation about the coming of Messiah. 
But uh, this cupbearer, he first describes uh, Joseph with three words. First of all, that he was a Hebrew. Uh, now, first of all, that he was young. Second of all, he was a Hebrew. And third, that he was a servant or a slave, the same word in Hebrew. All of these three things spoke greatly against Joseph. Uh, that he was young, it indicated that he did not have much wisdom, that he was a Hebrew. It showed that he was an immigrant, a foreigner, and he was very despised by the Egyptian people. Uh, the Hebrew, uh, Hebrews were rejected by the Egyptians, living as, a for, as foreigners. And then number three, he was a slave. All of this made him unqualified for a high position in Egypt. Nevertheless, the crisis was so great that Pharaoh decided to send for Joseph immediately. And in the Hebrew, it says that they rushed him out of the prison and put new clothes on him and shaved him. Now, this is what is referred to when Yeshua is saying several times, I am coming quickly. It is going to happen suddenly when he comes. And according to Jewish tradition, uh, Joseph came out of his prison on the Feast of Trumpets. And once again, this is then the prophecy that uh, at the sound of the last trumpet, the Feast of Trumpets is the feast that deals with the second coming of Messiah when he returns and he's going to have new clothes. He's not going to come as he came the first time. He's going to come in his father's glory and all the angels with him. Let me uh, go to a text in Matthew chapter 26, when Yeshua stood uh, chained before the high priest on trial and he interrogated him and he had been forsaken by all of his disciples. He stood there alone uh, as a criminal before the high priest. But then it says in uh, verse 64, Yeshua, Jesus said to him, you have said so, because in verse 63, the um, high priest had asked, let's read also verse 63 for the sake of context. But Jesus remained silent and the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God, tell us if you are the Messiah, the son of God. Are you the king, promised king, the son of David who will rule and reign not only over Israel, but over the whole world? Uh, do you have the audacity to claim that uh, standing before me here, chained uh, and uh, like a criminal? And then Yeshua said to him, you have said so, but I tell you from now on or after this, you will see the son of man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, he has uttered blasphemy. What further witnesses do we need? You have not heard the blasphemy. The blasphemy was that he claimed to be equal with God, sitting at the right hand of God, coming in his father's glory. And that was considered blasphemy by the high priest. But when Yeshua returns, he is going to come with such power and such glory that the, it says in the book of Revelation, when John saw him in his coming glory, he fell before him as a dead man. And at the end of chapter six, it talks about all the kings of the earth, how they are going to try to hide themselves. Uh, let's read uh, the text there in Revelation chapter six from verse 15. Then the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone, slave and free, hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks and the mountains, calling to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of his, the wrath has come and who can stand. So when Yeshua returns like that, how many Christians will recognize him in his new clothes? He's not going to come meek and humble. He's not going to come as the suffering servant. 
uh, who was born in the manger when he came the first time. Now the whole thing is completely reversed. He is going to come with the power of heaven in his father's glory. And this is what is pictured here by Joseph coming out as this rejected Hebrew young slave in new clothes uh, coming before the the throne of the so-called almighty in the world at that time, which Pharaoh is a picture of. And of course, Joseph is then interpreting the dreams that Pharaoh had. And uh, we can read from verse 25. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good ears are seven years. The dreams are one. Then the seven lean and ugly cows that came up after them are also seven years, and the seven empty ears blighted by the east wind are also seven years of famine. It is as I told Pharaoh, God has shown to Pharaoh what he is about to do. There will come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt. But after them, there will arise seven years of famine and all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt. The famine will consume the land. So this is the essence. There will be a great crisis in the end times. Uh, pictured by this famine. But before those uh, years of famine, there will be seven good years. Uh, And it is so important to take advantage of those seven years. Naturally, it is very easy to think that, well, we had a good year and now it's another good year and it continues like that for seven years. This seems to be the way it is nowadays. You know, there is no reason to believe that it will change. It will probably just continue. If you don't understand, no, during the seven good years, you have to prepare for what is coming in the seven years of famine. There will be a crisis at the end of this age. And so we need to prepare for that. And I want to give just two Um, passages out of many, many that I could read, but let's go to Luke chapter 21. We're going to read from verse 33. This is Yeshua speaking about the end times. And he says then bluntly, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But watch yourselves lest your hearts be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and cares of this life, referring to the seven good years here, Uh, and that day will come upon you suddenly like a trap, for it will come upon all who dwell on the face of the whole earth. That's why it says now in verse 36, but stay awake at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are going to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. We must must pray and be awake so that we can prepare for the evil days that are coming so that we can stand during that time. Also, Yeshua Jesus, he gave us the parable at the end of the Sermon on the Mount about the foolish man who built his house on sand. And when the storms and the floods came, the house fell. But the wise man who built his house on rock, on the solid rock, when the floods and the storms came, the house stood and it uh, could not destroy the house because it was built on some good foundation. And he says, this is the man who hears my words and obeys them. So we must enter in to obedience to God's word in every area of our lives. Then we are building our lives upon the solid rock like this man, wise man who built his house on solid rock. And when the evil times are coming, we will not be shaken. We will be able to stand and not be uh, um, destroyed by what is coming. 
So this is so important. We need to read the scriptures every day. We have our Bible reading plan, Daily Bread. I strongly recommend it to go to our web shop, arielmedia.se and order it if you don't already have it so that you, it's a great tool to come into a daily disciplined Bible reading. I practiced it myself for seven years now and it is uh, the greatest thing that I have in my life to every morning start by studying the scriptures, taking notes and make sure that I obey what is uh, God reveals to me from his word. Now, going back to the story here in Genesis chapter 41, because of this uh, wisdom that Joseph had to advise Pharaoh to um, prepare for the evil days by building barns during the good years to prepare for the famine that was coming, Pharaoh exalted him to his right hand. And uh, we can just read um, from verse 37, the proposal pleased Pharaoh and all his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find a man like this in whom is the spirit of God? Uh, then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has shown you all this, there is none so discerning and wise as you are. You shall be over my house and all my people shall order themselves as you command. Only as regards to the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, see, I have put you over the land of Egypt. Let's skip down to verse 43. And he made him ride in his second chariot and they called out before him, bow the knee. Thus he set him over all the land of Egypt. Now this is a picture of Joseph as a picture of Messiah ending up among the Gentiles where he is being exalted as a, as a savior and as a ruler. And that is what happened when Yeshua was uh, after his death and resurrection uh, among his own people. He ended up eventually among the Gentiles where he has been recognized as the savior of the world. But secondly, this is also a picture of uh, the coming exaltation of the Messiah as King of Kings and Lord of Lords at his return. And it says there in verse 43 that they cried out for, before him, bow the knee. Let's read the text from Philippians, the second chapter, the powerful words about Yeshua, the Messiah. Philippians chapter two, and it says, therefore, uh, well, let's read from verse seven. Um, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, Yeshua, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Yeshua the Messiah is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So Joseph is such a vivid picture of this, how he ended up in the dungeon, because he was sold by his own brothers as a slave to Egypt, but he came out of the pit and he was exalted. And now he is riding on a, on a horse or behind a horse in a chariot where they, they cry out, bow the knee to him. So let's go back to the story here again. And um, we can read later on that Pharaoh gave him, uh, verse 45, Pharaoh called Joseph's name, Safnat Paneach. Uh, he gave him a new name because he, he could not have his old Hebrew name that was too uh, lacking respect in Egypt. And in the same way, Yeshua of Nazareth, he has been uh, known, become known in the Gentile world by another name, not as Yeshua, but as Jesus. 
which has no connection. It's a, it's a transliteration of a Greek name, Jesus, uh, and that's how he has become known in the Gentile world. And then it says that um, in, further on in verse 45 here, that Pharaoh gave him in marriage Asenat, the daughter of Putifera, priest of On. Now, uh, according to tradition, Potiphera is the same as Potiphar. We know that Joseph was put in prison because he was accused of being uh, sexually immoral uh, with Potiphar's wife. But he was innocent. And because of his innocence, uh, Pharaoh, he uh, took away all that shame from his past by allowing him to be married to Potiphar's daughter. We know that Potiphar's wife was very beautiful and uh, her daughter was probably even more beautiful than that. And so uh, Joseph was rewarded for, because of his faithfulness uh, with, the marrying, with the marriage of Potiphar's daughter, Asenath. And with this daughter, he was given uh, two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. They were later on incorporated into Israel as sons of Jacob. We are going to deal with that later on in our commentaries. But um, these two sons of Joseph represent the followers of Jesus in the nations. Manasseh was the firstborn and his name uh, comes from a word that means to forget. Joseph said, I have forget my father's house. It is a symbol of the first generation of believers who were um, brought into the kingdom through the gospel of the apostles that they inherited together with Israel, the promises. But after a while, they forgot the Jewish people. But in the end times, Ephraim is a symbol of the people that will reconnect with the Jewish people. And Ephraim comes from a word that means doubly fruitful. There is going to be a tremendous harvest in the end times that will reconnect with the Jewish people. Well, we don't have time to talk more about this for this time, but thank you for watching this episode. And you can go to our website, thewatchman.org, and subscribe to uh, Weekly Torah if you want to have more on the commentaries uh, in the Torah portions. God bless you and Shalom from Jerusalem.